So tonight, I know you know who we are studying, and I'm going to learn a lot. I really don't know very much about St. Anthony or St. Oh, St. Benedict, a little bit, but not very much, but I'm going to end up knowing a lot. So would you like to open us in prayer? Sure. Okay. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Lord, um, I pray that tonight you would speak through the lives of St. Anthony and St. Benedict. Um, help us, especially as we start Lent, to learn from these holy men, um, their humility, their gentleness, their perseverance, their prayer, their eagerness for the gospel. Um, pray that you would be on our hearts and minds tonight in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. All right, yes, so tonight we're talking about St. Anthony the Great. Um, not to be confused with St. Anthony of Padua, who was another famous Anthony, but with an H. This is Anthony. Uh, Anthony was about 900 years after the saint we're talking about tonight. We're also talking about St. Benedict, which um, I'm sure you're familiar with him on some level. I've learned a lot uh, about him prepping for this class. Um, of course, founded the Benedictine Order, which we're going to be talking about. Uh, there's two books that I'd highly recommend um, that were really helpful in preparing. I, I read this a number of years ago and reread it. Uh, this is The Life of Antony, uh, which is a biography written by his contemporary, St. Athanasius, who is a friend of his, and we'll talk about him a little bit as well. Um, and this is called Man of Blessing, about St. Benedict. Uh, it's by Carmen Butcher, and um, it follows closely uh, Gregory the Great's account of Benedict's life, which we will get into as well. Um, so An Antony the Great, uh, born in 251, died in 356. Uh, Benedict, born in 480, died in 547. Um, there are some similarities between the stories of both of these men. Uh, they both came from wealthy families. Um, both had sisters who became nuns, although, uh, as we'll see, under different circumstances. Um, and we know of both of their lives due to biographies written um, by other saints from the time period, which is, I just find very cool that we have these primary sources. Um, and both began their ministries in the same way that Christ did. So, uh, of course, this past week, the gospel reading was um, Jesus going out into the desert for 40 days, fasting alone, and uh, being tempted by the devil. And that is how these guys started their ministries, as we will see, though they spent a lot more time in solitude because um, they probably needed it more than, more than Christ. <laughs> uh, so let's look at the timeline here, just to give you kind of um, a placement in history. So, of course, Christ is here with us uh, until 33 AD. Um, the first saint we're talking about tonight, Antony the Great, 251 to 356. Um, Athanasius, born uh, around 296 or 298, died in 373. He was the biographer of Anthony and his friend. Um, St. Benedict, we'll also talk about, 480 to 547. And Pope Gregory the Great was his biographer, who um, overlaps him by a few years and was very familiar with people who knew him and his story. Um, and these are of course, also well-known saints. Um, Athanasius had a lot to do with the Council of Nicaea in 325. Um, and if you know the term Gregorian chant, that comes from Gregory the Great, who uh, sort of codified the chant tradition, even though none of it would be written down until the 9th and 10th century, um, much later than he lived. Um, so that sort of places us in history. And also, I wanted to talk a little bit about Augustine, because he's he kind of bridges the gap between these two guys. He lived from 354 to 430, and of course he's probably the most familiar of these, these fellows. Um, so just a couple of notes about Augustine, because there is some connection here. Uh, before St. Augustine was a Christian, um, he was a Manichaean. And what that meant is he believed that God was a, a powerful, good being in the universe opposed to the devil, who was a powerful, evil being in the universe. It was almost like two ends of the same coin. They were the same kind of thing. One was good, one's evil. Um, and it wasn't until he 
learned from the Christian tradition that God is the transcendent source of all being and God is goodness itself, uh, that he began to move towards Christianity. Um, he also read St. Origen. Uh, one of the stumbling blocks for Augustine is that he, he couldn't reconcile a literal reading of the Genesis account of creation. But through reading Origen, that helped him understand that there are other ways to read Genesis, and he came closer to Christianity. And then this book written by Athanasius, The Life of St. Antony, played a key role in his conversion. Um, so let's get into Antony. Antony the Great, um, uh, let's see. So in the, in the introduction to the biography of Antony, Athanasius says that a big part of his reason for writing the book is for the benefit of those interested in the monastic life um, and so that they can be imitators of St. Antony as his way of life provides monks with a sufficient picture of ascetic practice. So that's his purpose for writing this book as um, somewhat of a pedagogical work. Um, Antony was born again in 251 into a wealthy family in Egypt. Uh, he was raised as a Christian and had one young sister. Um, so he was used to church life, a regular churchgoer and so forth. His parents both died when he was 18 or 20, and that's really all we know. We don't know the circumstances around their death. Um, and for the next six months after he died, it was a period of time when Antony was really doing some heavy soul searching. Uh, he continued to be deeply involved in the church community, um, and he was pondering on the apostles and how they, forsake, they forsook everything uh, for the sake of following Christ. Um, and so he's thinking about these things, and after about six months, he goes to church, and one of the readings is the reading of the rich young ruler, who, as we know, uh, came to Christ, said, how do I become holy? I've, done all, I've followed all the commandments since my birth. What do I do? And Christ says, if you would be perfect, go, sell what you possess, and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Um, and of course, in that story, we don't know the outcome, right? The rich young man leaves saddened. Maybe he changed his mind later. We can hope, but who knows. But this reading had a deep effect on young Antony. And immediately upon leaving that church service, he began the process of giving away his land inheritance to the townspeople, to the village that he was a part of. Uh, we're told that he had inherited 300 aurorae of fertile and beautiful land uh, in uh, today's measurement, that's about 207 acres. So it's a significant plot of land that he gave. Um, he sold what was portable and donated the money to the poor, although he kept some for the care of his sister. So then not long, later, uh, not long after this, he goes back to church. And this week, the gospel reading is the Lord saying, don't be anxious about tomorrow. And this just draws Antony further into his newfound commitments. And so he gives away his remaining possessions to the needy, and um, he gives his sister over the, to the convent to be a nun. And so, a uh, <laughs> little bit different time, right? And that's the last we hear of Antony's sister. So we can assume she lived a holy life as a nun. Um, and then he devoted his life to uh, what's called the discipline. Now, it's important to note that at this time, there was no great monastery in Egypt, and um, we know now about the Desert Fathers, which we're going to be talking more about, uh, but at this time, no monk had just gone out into the Egyptian desert. Uh, you would have sort of holy men in solitude or in groups of a few outside of villages living the ascetic life. So Antony began seeking out someone to guide him, and he finds an old hermit outside of the village who begins to train him uh, in the monastic life. So um, he was committed to uh, not being a burden financially on anyone, and so he continued to work with his hands, uh, and he would give his extra earnings that he didn't need for food or basic necessities to the poor. Uh, and he became known in the village as a gracious man, eager in prayer, free from anger, and loved by all. Uh, the villagers called him God-loved, some called him son, others brother. So it's clear that Though he was trying to live this uh, life of solitude, he was in 
deep community. And that's what, I've, through reading the, these books, that's what I've found so striking is Christians who do this don't just go out, live alone, and that's it. They're still in community with God's people. Um, so, just as Christ went out into the desert and the devil came to tempt him, Antony had his first reckoning with the devil who came and tried to get him to give up the life and come back to his wealth and so forth. But Antony re rebuked him, saying, You then are much to be despised and powerless like a child. From now on you cause me no anxiety, for the Lord is my helper, and I shall look upon my enemies. And the devil fled in fear, as Athanasius tells us. Uh, so here's how he was living in those early days of his monastic life. He ate once daily after sunset, but often he went uh, a few days or even four days without food. Uh, what he ate was bread and salt, and he drank only water and had a very simple mat for sleeping. And we'll see that this differs a bit from Benedict when we get there. Um, but despite his extreme li living, he always held that the ascetic and virtuous life was not to be measured by the time spent or the sacrifices made, but rather by the aspirant's desire for God and purposefulness. So he never lost sight of the reason he was doing these things, which is not the case for many of these monks of the period. Some of them really got so into the ascetic life, it was all about how, how long can I fast and how much can I give up, forgetting that these things are to open themselves up to the grace of God. Um, he very much lived in the present. Every day he considered to be a new beginning. Um, and so after some time, he decided that he needed to leave the village. So he uh, brought a friend along and just hiked away from the village, came upon uh, a series of tombs, and he made his home in a tomb, which is quite strange, but that's what he was led to do. So. He charged his friend to seal him in this tomb and bring him bread at, after a certain amount of time so he could continue to live there. So after a while, his friend came back and found that Antony had been attacked by demons and they had physically assaulted him. So he was beaten, he was close to death, and his friend took him back to the village uh, and tended to his wounds. That night, Antony awoke saw that the villagers were asleep, save his one friend, and he implored his friend to bring him back to the tomb. So his friend brought him back to the tomb and sealed him back up, uh, and he continued to pray. Uh, he was attacked a second time, we're told, by Athanasius, uh, by demons disguised as animals. And this time, Antony rebuked them and prayed to the Lord, and he saw Christ's presence come like a beam of light through the ceiling. The demons dispersed, and he was instantly healed of all his wounds. Now, you know, uh, and this is such a, a human element, he was deeply scarred by this, and he questioned God. So I'm going to read a quote from Athanasius' account here. Antony says, Where were you? Why didn't you appear at the beginning so that you could stop my distresses? And a voice came to him. I was here, Antony, but I waited to watch your struggle, and now, since you persevered and were not defeated, I will be your helper forever and I will make you famous everywhere. On hearing this, he stood up and prayed, and he was so strengthened that he felt his body contained more might than before. And at this time, he was about 35 years old. So that's the last we hear of any real attack like that that actually hurts Antony. From this time on, he's so strengthened by the Lord that uh, he just seems to be uninhibited by, by evil presences. So at this point, he leaves the tomb. This is his next step and he goes into the wild desert. Though he does ask the old man, the old hermit that he had trained with to come with him, and that man says, I'm good. Uh, I'm old, nobody goes into the desert, that's not how we do this, go on your way. So he goes into the desert, he's tempted along the way. Uh, we're told that the devil shows him gold and silver and he denies it, keeps going. And he comes upon an abandoned fortress and makes it his home. Um, there's water flowing there, so he has plenty of water, and we're told that he kept enough bread for six months. And at this point, it's clear that Athanasius knows that the reader will question this, like he's keeping bread for six months at a time, right? Um, and Athanasius notes that this is a common practice for the Thebans, and they have a type of bread that can remain unspoiled for up to one year. So 
I can't imagine this is very tasty bread. It's probably like hard tack kind of bread, right? Uh, but Athanasius makes the point of saying, no, no, this really exists, right? So he shut himself in. He wouldn't allow visitors to enter, but many people would visit him and he would just keep the door closed and they'd stay with him for days at a time uh, and he would pray with them and talk with them but would not let them in. Um, and his friends would come to visit often and they, they would come fearing that he had died, right? Um, but they said they would always find him joyfully singing psalms. So he spent 20 years in the fortress alone. Um, but many, became, many began to come to him wanting to emulate him, wanting to be uh, monks themselves and to follow his lead. And so his friends came, tore down the door, and dragged him out by force, <laughs> as good friends do. <laughs> and Antony was not annoyed, but rather he was elated to be embraced by so many. And so in the ensuing days, there was a crowd there, and through him the Lord healed many who suffered bodily ailments. He purged demons. Antony preached. He consoled those who mourned, and he helped reconcile broken friendships. Um, and so he had many there who wanted to follow him. And he decided it's time to move on to the next part of my life. And he brought a group of monks with him further into the desert to a mountain and established a city of monks. And this was the start of what we know of as the Desert Fathers. So Antony, their leader, lived in the inner mountain and these monks lived in the outer mountain. Um, so what did life for these monks look like? Well, their cells in the mountains um, are described as being like tents of divine choirs with people constantly chanting, studying, fasting, praying, rejoicing in hope for the future, working on distributing alms to the poor, and maintaining love and harmony amongst themselves. Um, so that's what we get from sort of the first part of this uh, biography. And then Athanasius spends a lot of time just quoting Anthony in his instructions to the monks. Again, this is a pedagogical work. It's meant for aspiring ascetics to read it and have something to go out into their own desert and uh, be fortified. So, um, so I'm going to read a little bit of his teaching here. So Antony, teaching his monks, says, Let none among us have even the yearning to possess. For what benefit is there in possessing these things that we do not take with us? Why not rather own those things that we are able to take away with us, such things as prudence, justice, temperance, courage, understanding, love, concern for the poor, faith in Christ, freedom from anger, and hospitality? If we possess these, we shall discover them running before, preparing hospitality for us in the land of the meek. And then he's teaching them um, about the apostle's statement, I die daily. He says, for if we so live as people dying daily, we will not commit sin. The point of the saying is this, as we rise daily, let us suppose that we shall not survive till evening. And again, as we prepare for sleep, let us consider that we shall not awaken. But it, by its very nature, our life is uncertain and is meted out daily by providence. And so he had this deep sense of each day is a new beginning and we live with Christ in the present with full trust and faith in Christ. Um, he has a lot to say about fighting demons, which is fascinating to read. Um, <laughs> and again, I can't cover everything in here, but I commend it to you. Um, one of the interesting things he continually comes back to is that um, when Christ came, he tore the power away from the evil one. And uh, so he's constantly encouraging his monks that through prayer, um, through knowing Christ, you are protected and you are empowered to help those afflicted. Um, he talks about the Greeks, the ancient Greek gods, and says that those were demonic in nature. He says that the old Greek oracle, oracles were in communication with demons. And he, he gives this example of demonic trickery. He says, don't be fooled if a demon comes to you, this has never happened to me, by the way, if a demon comes to you and makes a prophecy that so-and-so is going to come visit you in three days' time, if it comes true, don't be surprised because it's not real prophecy. 
They just were able to see that your friend left his house coming in your direction and they kind of made a good guess. So that's essentially what uh, Antony tells us. Um, and I'll read one account of his encounter um, with the devil here because it's just interesting. He says, receive this. So he's, again, he's teaching his monks. So he's asking them to receive this story. Receive this as well for your protection and fearlessness and trust me for I am not lying. Once someone knocked at the door of my cell and when I went out, I saw someone who seemed massive and tall. When I asked, who are you? He said, I am Satan. And I said, what are you doing here? And he asked, why do the monks and all the other Christians censure me without cause? Why do they curse me every hour? When I replied, why do you torment them? He said, I'm not tormenting them, but they disturb themselves, for I have become weak. Haven't they read that the swords of the enemy have failed utterly and that you have destroyed their cities? I no longer have a place, no weapon, no city. There are Christians everywhere, and even in the desert, uh, it's filled with monks. <laughs> Let them watch after themselves and stop censuring me for no reason. Marveling then at the grace of the Lord, I said to them, even though you are always a liar and never tell the truth, nevertheless, this time, even if you did not intend to, you have spoken truly. For Christ in his coming reduced you to weakness, and after throwing you down, he left you defenseless. Upon hearing the Savior's name and being unable to endure the scorching from it, he became invisible. So it's filled with great stories like that. Uh, so there's other accounts from his life that are interesting in this, um, in Athanasius's bio. Uh, there was a great persecution, persecution of Christians under Maximin, and um, Athanasius didn't stand idly by. He took a group of monks, went to Alexandria, and defended the Christians any way he could, which included making arguments in courts of law. So imagine going to I know there's lawyers in the room, Court and Montgomery, and there's a guy in sackcloth who's defending. <laughs> Just amazing, right? So um, there's another account, and this is where we get into Council of Nicaea stuff. So Athanasius is known for one thing, for combating Arianism. Does anyone know what Arianism was, that heresy? So Arianism is the belief that Christ was a created being that there was a beginning to his life like ours. Uh, and this was rampant in um, the 300s. And that's one of the things that the Council of Nicaea was called to deal with. Um, if you've ever heard the story of St. Nicholas, Santa Claus punching Arius in the face, that was the guy. Arius was the heretic there. Um, also, the Council of Nicaea dealt with Trinitarian theology and codified that, among other things. So. There are all these Arians running around, and there's plenty in here about not trusting the Arians and so forth. So um, they were falsely claiming that Antony held the same views as them. And so Antony was summoned to Alexandria by the bishop, Athanasius, his friend, and he publicly renounced uh, their beliefs. Uh, but he spent a few days there healing people and driving out demons, uh, and Athanasius was with him, who says, um, he says this, it is beyond a doubt that as many became Christians in those few days when Antony was in Alexandria as one would have seen in a year. So this man was, through his witness, just converting people left and right. He came into town and people became Christians. Um, again, there's a lot more in that book, but uh, I think that's the main points I wanna hit. So we're gonna move on to St. Benedict. Um, so Benedict was born in 480, again, in the town of Nursia, in the Apennine valleys and mountains of central Italy. This is the region of Umbria, um, as we know it today. Um, the classical poet Virgil wrote about this area's rocky, harsh conditions, saying that the area breeds mountaineers who excel in toughness, and Benedict was certainly one of these. Um, I want to give you a little bit of a picture of the political backdrop. Um, so fifth century Italy was uh, in upheaval. The Roman Empire was declining. It was war-torn. There were diseases, plagues, famine. Overall, quite uncertain times. This is the backdrop for much of Benedict's ministry. Um, in 943, so he was 13 years old, after years of war, the Roman-backed Goth Theodoric took power. 
Um, during his 40-year reign, there was relative stability, and that coincided with Benedict's adulthood. But other than that kind of relative stability, it was um, quite crazy times. Uh, Theodoric dies in 526, opening Italy to invaders. And for the next decade, um, it's just turmoil. Uh, then Emperor Justinian I takes control, and it's even worse under his rule. rule. Uh, there's famine, there's many single mothers, and I want to read you a quote about this guy. So this is written by his contemporary, a historian called Procopius, um, about Emperor Justinian I. He says, he was simultaneously evil and agreeable. To put it colloquially, he was a moron. He, ne <laughs> he never spoke truth. He was always mendacious in what he said and did, but he also was also easily tricked by anyone wanting to deceive him. His personality was a perverse mix of idiocy and cruelty. If you cared to add up every tragedy that happened to the Romans before Justinian came to power, and then compared these with the emperor's list of heinous crimes, I think you would quickly discover that more people were murdered by this one man than in all of history. So this is the backdrop for Benedict's ministry to that area of the world. And it's in sharp contrast to uh, Benedict's rule, which is his major written contribution, um, which we'll get more into it in just a little bit, but his rule, um, it's essentially how to be a monk and how to run a monastery. It's still used today by the Benedictine orders, um, and it emphasizes peace with God and harmony with others. Um, there were other monastic rules written before Benedict's, but his was unique in its grace, humility, practicality, things like this. Um, so going back to uh, his early life, Benedict was born to lesser Ro a lesser Roman nobleman, uh, so again, wealthy like Antony. Um, tradition gives him a twin sister, Scholastica, uh, and she would become a nun as well, but as far as we know, by her own volition. So <laughs> uh, around the time of St. Patrick's death in Ireland, which was in 493, Benedict moved to Rome to be educated, uh, where he was able to study in Roman classical schools. Um, and it's very possible that he would have studied other monastic rules, such as the rule of St. Basil um, at the time. And that, that rule, the rule of St. Basil, is still used by the Orthodox monks today. Um, he was, as a teenager, uninterested in joining his peers' endless cycle of hard studying and then hard drinking. He was not interested in, in that life. He, he did enjoy studies, but to a point, he, he didn't like what he called rhetoric for rhetoric's sake. Um, and so when he was 20 years old, uh, much the same age as Antony, he leaves his life of wealth and inheritance behind. Um, and so much of what we know, again, about Benedict's life is from the biography written by Pope Gregory. So I'm going to be re referencing Gregory, and I'm just referring to that biography. Gregory tells us that he performed his first, um, oh, I skipped some things, sorry. According to Gregory, his only desire was to please the Lord. So he walks away from Rome, 40 miles east to the Simbrucini uh, Mountains, and he brings his childhood nurse to help care for the day-to-day -day things. Um, he comes upon the Church of St. Peter, and the Christian community there <coughs> just envelops them, draws them in, and gives them lodging. Um, and this is where Gregory tells us that Benedict performs his first miracle. So his nurse was working in the kitchen um, in this community, and she was borrowing an expensive tool that was just a clay sifter and broke it accidentally. So Gregory comes in and finds her weeping, has compassion on her, and he takes the pieces of this broken tool back to his room, prays for a while, and then finds it restored. And I think what Gregory shows us through this miracle is Benedict's compassion in the little things of life, right? Like, that's not a great, he mended a kitchen tool. And I think that's a, just a beautiful picture of who this man was. He, was. he was humble and compassionate, even in the small things. Um, so, unfortunately for Benedict, this miracle garnered him unwanted fame. Uh, he was getting too much attention, so he left. 
and um, he started hiking in a few miles north uh, in a place called Subiaco. He met a monk named Romanus, and this was the beginning of a long friendship. They walked together and talked, and Benedict expressed his interest in being a hermit, and so Romanus lived in a monastery in Subiaco above a cliff line that went down to a river, and there were some caves down by the river. So Romanus led him to these caves, said, um, you can stay here and do your hermitage in these caves. I'll bring you bread occasionally, and I won't tell anyone you're here. And that was enough for Benedict. Um, and so Benedict would live in this cave alone for three years. Uh, Romanus gave him a sheepskin garnet, uh, garment, and um, he would occasionally come when he had extra bread, tie it to a string, tie a bell to the string, and lower it down to his friend Benedict. Benedict would hear the, the bell and come out of whatever he was doing and get his bread and move on. Uh, and we're told here, uh, much like Antony and like Christ, he battled with the devil and was made stronger in his commitment to Christ through that. So oddly enough, the cave was the site of, uh, or the former site of a Roman uh, luxury villa with man-made lakes. This is nearby the cave, not the cave itself. And that abandoned luxury villa had been built by the Emperor Nero. Um, and so because of this, the Catholic Church has made Benedict, among many other things, the patron saint of reclaimed, uh, of land reclamation. So that's one of his patronages. Also, because he lived in a cave, he's the patron saint of spelunkers. So you've got that too. <laughs> um, so here, Benedict would spend countless hours praying for others, fasting, communicating with God, and fighting the cravings of the flesh. And he grew to love his solitude. Um, and much like we saw with Ant uh, Antony, his experience of time was very much in the present. Um, Days and weeks would pass without notice. Easter's would pass, and for Benedict, every day was, to him, Easter. Uh, but he began to be concerned that he was becoming selfish, staying in the solitude that he loved. So again, this is a man that was doing all these extreme things, but always looking beyond them to uh, the grace that he was being drawn into. He, wasn't, he was trying to not get too into the asceticism and always focus on communion with God. Um, so then Gregory tells us that one Easter Sunday around the turn of the sixth century, God appeared to a priest not far from Subiaco, and God said, you made yourself a delicious dinner, but did you know my servant Benedict is thin and hungry? And so immediately the priest got up, packed up his food and wine, and went out in search of Benedict. Um, after many miles of walking along the river, he found uh, this holy man in his sheepskin, dirty, long hair, long beard, and he shouted, come brother, eat with me, it's Easter. And they talked for hours and ate. Benedict was surprised. He said, I didn't know Lent was over, because again, his conception of time was not like ours, right? Um, and finally, the priest said, you've been isolated long enough. The world needs you, and he urged Benedict to come out. But this wasn't quite enough for Benedict. He remained in the cave. Uh, we're told that um, there were some villagers who, uh, some shepherds who found his cave, at first thought he was an animal, and then realized, oh, that's a man. So they started talking to him, and they were so blessed by the conversation that they went back to town joyful uh, and re reported to many uh, this man in the cave with the kind spirit. Um, and so like with Antony, many people started visiting this cave to speak with this holy man, to be prayed over, to be healed. Um, and this was the humble start of the Benedictines. So all kinds of people were coming, shepherds, peasants, pagans, monks, nobility, royalty. Uh, and then at one time he was visited by a group of monks from a nearby um, monastery about 20 miles away down the river. Their abbot had just died, so they asked Benedict to come and be their new leader. And Benedict refused, because he sensed that there was insincerity among these monks. Um, he sensed that these monks prided themselves in the ascetic ways of life, 
and that that was the end for them was the giving up of things. Um, and so they lived in a series of small caves. They kept coming back, kept asking, persisted, persisted, badgered and badgered. And finally, Benedict said, OK, I will come lead you. And so he goes to lead them. He tries to organize these disorganized monks. And they did not like his leadership. And they did not like his rules. And so naturally, this group of monks plotted to murder him. <laughs> so dangerous time to be a monk, right? <laughs> So they, at dinner one night, they poisoned his wine. The wine was brought to him, and we're told he made the sign of the cross over the wine, and it immediately burst. And he knew at that moment that it had been poisoned. And rather than lash out, he calmly chastised them and said goodbye and went back to his cave. <laughs> but after that, his following grew. Um, and eventually, he had so many people like, like before Antony goes into the mountains, he had so many people coming to him saying, we want to follow you, we want to learn this life of discipline. He just realized he had to find a place um, to house them. And so he left Subiaco forever. So that's the end of his three year stint in the cave. Uh, and then he goes, not far from there, but builds the first of 13 monasteries in Subiaco. Uh, and he ends up being the abbot over all of them, but they're, they're individual communities. Uh, and it's at this time that he begins to contemplate his rule, which he hasn't written down yet. He's just thinking, how can I leave something for future generations to be able to create an orderly life for people who want this monastic life? Um, his monks, we're told, came from very diverse backgrounds. They were highborn, they were peasants, they were natives, they were foreigners. They were educated, they were illiterate, some were young, some middle-aged, some old, and the reputation of the monks and of Benedict just continued to grow. And so Roman patricians started bringing their children and asking him to educate their kids. And so he built schools and started teaching children. Uh, and he led as the abbot of Subiaco for two decades. So 20 years he was there guiding the monks, teaching children in monastic schools, preaching, serving the local community, and working miracles. And at the end of these two decades, we get our second assassination attempt on Benedict. <laughs> so there's a nearby priest named Florentius um, who knew that Benedict had a better reputation than himself for holiness, and he was jealous, and he was angry. And he began to try to undermine Benedict's ministry. And so at first, he just went around telling lies about Benedict. But no one believed him because Benedict had such a reputation as a holy man. So that didn't work. So then he poisoned some bread and sent it as a gift to Benedict. Uh, but um, Benedict just knew it was toxic. God gave him the grace to know, don't touch this. Probably he saw from Florentius and he thought, probably not going to eat that. <laughs> so he, um, he had a trained pet raven, which is awesome. And he had his raven take this bread as far away as possible and hide it in a bush where nobody would find it. So two, two strikes for Florentius, but Florentius was persistent. And so then he hired seven attractive women to go to the monastery and dance naked outside. A priest did this. <laughs> and Bened this was too much for Benedict. He was concerned for his brothers. He didn't want them tempted in this way. And he gave in, and he left Subiaco. And Florentius won. He appointed uh, Maris, his, one of his um, monks, to be the abbot of Subiaco. And then not long after, Florentius, we're told, went out to his deck to celebrate, and his deck collapsed, and he died. Maris was overjoyed. And he chased down Benedict, who was on his way out to wherever God would lead him. Um, and he begged Benedict to come back and lead the monks. But Benedict uh, refused. And he, he was troubled by the death of Florentius. Even though he was his enemy, this is such a picture of loving your enemies. He was troubled by this man's death. And he was maybe more troubled by Morris's joy over his death. And he told Morris, my path lies elsewhere. Yours is at Subiaco, my son. He knew that God had other plans for him. So at this point, he's in his 40s. 
um, a number of monks came with him and they left on foot. 70 miles away, they came across a mountain that was about 1,700 feet in eleva elevation called Monte Cassino. And they felt that this was the place where they would begin building. Uh, but this time, rather than building a number of small monasteries, um, he decided to build one large one on the mountain. And when they got up there, they found a pagan temple to Apollo. So they smashed the Apollo statue, overturned altars, and then recycled stones to build the Chapel of St. Martin and the Oratory to St. John the Baptist, which was consecrated. Um, and that's where the pagan altar had been. And Benedict and his sister Scholastica are, to this day, buried under the high altar at the Oratory to St. John the Baptist at Monte Cassino, which is still an active Benedictine monastery. Although it was destroyed several times, most recently in World War II, the Germans were encamped on Monte Cassino and the allies coming up from below made the decision to bomb it. So they bombed the monastery and unfortunately it was not effective. Um, but after the war, it was rebuilt again and the monks re-inhabited it. And th this had happened before, you know, it'd been destroyed several times. Um, and so one thing to note here is these monks didn't go get contractors and they didn't have cranes. These guys built stone churches with their bare hands. These were, you know, I think we tend to think of monks as just these very pious guys that just pray, which they do and they are pious, but they can also build extravagant buildings out of stone with their own hands. So that's pretty amazing. Um, and it's here at Monte Cassino when St. Benedict uh, puts pen to paper and writes his rule that he's been contemplating for decades. That's around the year 530. So we'll talk a little bit about his rule. There's wide appeal for it, and it's written for a diverse audience. It's, not, it re, it's an instruction for monks, but he also wants it to be spiritual guidance for lay people. And he says in the prologue, my words are meant for you specifically, whoever and wherever you are, uh, wanting to turn from your own self-will and join Christ, the Lord of all. Now, rather than writing in the ancient classical Latin or in the scholarly Latin of his day, uh, although he was educated in, in those practices, he wrote it in the lingua vulgaris, which was spoken and read by many more people. So this was meant to be an accessible work. He wrote it in colloquial language, and it's not, in it's not very long at all. Um, in English, it's about 30 pages. Um, Benedict's uh, rule stresses balance, the balance of work and prayer. He advocates for divine peace. He teaches prayer as the mightiest weapon and sincere kindness as the strongest strategy. And he hoped that his rule, that with his rule, he had set down nothing burdensome. And so this is at, in contrast with some of the older rules for monks. Like he would have been very familiar with the rule of the master which refers to God as a terrifying Lord and focuses on punishment. But Benedict's rule, by contrast, emphasizes God as a loving father and focuses on mercy. And there's a sense of moderation in Benedict's rule. Um, for example, as we've talked about a few times now, some monks concentrated on extreme asceticism, but Benedict did not want his brothers fasting around the clock, keeping red-eyed vigils through the night, or working till they burned out. Instead, he wanted them to eat sensibly, pray and sleep regularly, engage in physical work for about six hours a day, do some relative or some moderate reading, and take a uh, summer siesta if needed. And in place of this extreme asceticism, Benedict stressed community building. Um, so I want to read a little bit more from this book here. This is from chapter two of the rule, which describes the quality of an, a, an ideal abbot. So an abbot who is worthy to be over a monastery should always remember what he is called and live up to his name because he is believed to hold the place of Christ in the monastery as seen in his being called one of Christ's names taken from the words of the apostle, you have received a spirit of adoption and cry, Abba, Father. Therefore, the abbot should not teach or command anything that contradicts the Lord's teaching. And then Gregory points out um, in his biography that Benedict's own character is palpable and written into this rule. Um, Gregory says this, 
Although Benedict gained much recognition from his miracles, the holy man was no less distinguished for his wisdom in teaching. His rule is remarkable for its wisdom and clarity of language. Anyone who wishes to know more about Benedict's life and character can discover in his rule exactly what he was like as an abbot, for his life could not have differed from his teaching. Um, so there's essentially four themes covered in the rule. Uh, half of it is about how to be obedient and humble and what to do when a member of the community is not being those things. Uh, a fourth of it discusses the worship of God, liturgies, the daily prayers, etc. A tenth of it um, discusses how and by whom a monastery should be managed, and it covers very practical things. Uh, and a tenth of it focuses on the abbot's pastoral duties. Um, and so this book, again, Man of Blessing, has just a really nice uh, summary of all the chapters of the rule. And I thought I'd read a few of these summaries that I found interesting and that really show the nature of it. So in chapter one, he talks about the different kinds of monks. Uh, there's the Chenobites, which are monks who live in a monastery under an abbot. There's anchorites or hermits who live the solitary life. There's cerebates who live in twos and threes together with no fixed rule. And the gyrovagi who wander disreputably uh, from one monastery to the other. And he claims that the monks like his are the bravest of those monks. So <laughs> I think uh, in some way for someone who wants solitude, living in a group of a lot of people probably is a, a brave act, right? Um, chapter four discusses the ne necessities of obedience um, are found in the Ten Commandments. Uh, and this is not in the Ten Commandments, obviously, but one of Benedict's favorite rules that he discusses in chapter four is don't complain. Um, chapters eight through 19, uh, mindful participation in the divine office, the Opus Dei is paramount. Um, and this goes through the liturgies of the hours that they would recite every day. Chapter 20 is all about prayer. It points out that if we approach someone powerful on earth with reverence when we want to ask them something, with how much more humility should we approach God? Also, and I, th I think this is great, brevity in prayer is encouraged. God is said to look at the purity of our hearts, not at the number of our words. And the rule especially points out that the best communal prayers are brief. Um, chapter 22 uh, describes how monastic members are to sleep. They sleep in their habits because they need to be able to be called out like a fireman at the drop of a hat, right? Um, chapter 31, a very practical cha chapter, is how to appoint a cellarer who is the man in charge of the cellar. He needs to be of certain character, not liking wine too much because he's got the vat there with him, right? So he talks about this. Um, uh, 33 and 34, private ownership is forbidden. Uh, possessions are shared by the community. Chapters 39 to 41, these regulate monastic food and drink. Two meals a day are recommended with two or three dishes of cooked food at each. Also, each brother or sister is allowed a pound of bread and about a pint of wine, half pint of wine. Meat is given only to the sick and the weak, uh, and mealtimes vary with the seasons. Um, and this we're going to actually read from the rule. Chapter 49 describes how to observe Lent. And I think this chapter in particular, just because it's Lent for one thing, but also it shows the character of this work, which we'll, we'll talk about. Um, sorry, I've got it here. So this is the chapter on uh, how the monks are to observe Lent. He says, although the life of a monk ought always to have a Lenten character, yet because few have the degree of strength requisite for that, we therefore exhort that at least during Lent, he live his life with scrupulous care and that likewise during this holy season, he do away with any departures from strictness that may have been permitted at other times. And this is then done worthily when we restrain us from all faults and give heed to prayer with tears, to reading and to heartfelt penitence and to abstinence. Therefore, at this season, let us betake to us as some addition to the accustomed severity of our holy servitude, special prayers and abstinence from food and drink, so that each of his own free will with the joy of the Holy Spirit may offer to God somewhat over and above the measure laid upon him. That is to say, let him deny himself in the matter of food, of sleep, of talking, of mirth, 
and let him look forward to Holy Easter with the joy of spiritual longing. Let each one, however, confide to his abbot exactly what he is offering, and let it be done with the help of prayer and consent, because what is done without the consent of one spiritual father will not be accounted meritorious, but rather presumptuous and vainglorious. Therefore, it is with the abbot's consent that all things are to be done. And so he, ad he admits in that that not all monks are great at being monks, right? There's a lot of mercy in there. He's like, if you're not great at fasting, maybe during Lent this is the time for you to fast. But he doesn't say you have to. He says, get with your abbot, decide what to do with their consent, and do it. And so it's, it's firm, but it's so gentle, loving, and open, and it's, it's so meant for, for grace and not just for the act itself. Um, so I want to go through the daily life of a Benedictine. It varies, I'm sure, but this is one example. So here's what a day in the life of one of these monks might look like. They would arise at 2 a.m. and head to the chapel for vigils. By five, they've spent three hours in communal prayer and recitation of psalms called the Opus Dei or the Work of God or the Divine Office as we know it. Um, then they'd turn to Lectio Divina, or, which is a meditative spiritual reading of scripture. At daybreak around 6 a.m., they chanted matins, which is morning, and lauds, which means praise. Uh, at full daylight, about 6.45, the divine office called prime, or the first hour, begins. At 7.30 to 8, there's a brief time for reading, writing, and other duties, uh, at which time they change their shoes and wash their face before returning to the oratory to sing the tears or the third hour. Then the morrow, or morning mass, in the chapter of faults is, uh, occurs. The chapter of faults is where breaches of discipline were confessed or alleged and then corrected. So every morning we'd say, hey, I didn't do great at this, and the abbot would say, hey, you didn't do great at this, and we'd reconcile, right? Um, announcements were made and blessing was prayed over the day's work. 9.45 to 12.30 uh, was work time. This could be intellectual, educational, manual labor, labor administrative, or service-oriented. They joined together for sext, or the sixth hour, following, uh, followed by a high-sung mass. Then at 1.30, the nones, or the ninth hour, was celebrated. At 2 p.m., they'd have a simple meal. 3 to 5 p.m. was, uh, again, Lectio Divina, the spiritual reading of scripture. And then they'd have Vespers or Evensong. After this, they'd have the Maundy. And we know what this is because we have Maundy Thursday which is the ceremonial washing of feet every day for these guys. Uh, then a glass of wine was consumed before a short public reading, 6.15 p.m. for Compline, and then in bed by 7 for seven hours of sleep. And so by the end of the week, with all of this prayer, they would have sung all 150 song, psalms every week. Um, so it's such a picture for me of the body of Christ, right? Like these are the people called to be in prayer constantly. I can't do that. I, many people can't. And that's where we come to like, what do we make of this for us? I mean, we're at the start of Lent and this is the time of the church year when we as lay people are invited to sort of dip our toe in the monastic life, right? Take on a discipline. You're not asked to pray 10 times a day, but maybe add morning prayer into your routine Maybe give up coffee. It says, uh, he suggested maybe considering limiting talking. So a lot of people give up social media, right? Um, it's our opportunity to kind of have a little bit more disciplined life in order to open ourselves up to God's grace. Um, so I think that's a, the best picture I can give you in this amount of time of the lives of these men. Um, are there any questions before we do a brief uh, prayer together? Yes. Did Anthony attend the Council of Nicaea? I don't know that Anthony attended. I don't, it didn't say anything in the book indicating that. So I think he was probably praying for it in his mountain. But Athanasius was certainly there. So, yeah. I have another question. Sure. Who, who was the priest who sent the dancing girls to the monastery? <laughs> Florentius was his name. So, yeah. <laughs> Lord save his soul. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Yeah. Why was Anthony called the Great? Um, I think 
That's a good question, and I'll just give my take rather than anything based in historical account. Um, I think there's a reason that Athanasius wrote about him and that we don't have such a detailed account of any previous monk in Christian history that I'm aware of. Um, I think his practice was just so focused, so Christ-centered, so effective, and he was such a man of God and such a man of courage that his reputation was great, right? Um, and so what I learned through preparing for this, and I, I had read that, so it was great to reread it. I didn't know much about Benedict's actual life, but for me, there's, it's, it's like Antony starts something that then St. Benedict really codifies and makes it into something that can be used throughout the centuries. So, I mean, you could, you could read this and go try to live the ascetic life, but what Benedict left us is his rule, which, again, is used in every Benedictine monastery to this day, and it's just proven to be effective in, in organizing a community of prayer. So... As far as I know, yeah, and that's where maybe there's differences in schedule, right? But um, it's something like that. So for, and so let me say, um, uh, there is a Benedictine monastery in Conyers, Georgia that you can visit. And just as there were many visitors to Antony, many visitors to Benedict, that's still something we can do today. And Leanne Hester and Leah Slauson have visited that monastery many times. So I would say, pull them aside and ask them about the monastery in Conyers, because they'll have a lot to tell you about it. Um, have you? Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's awesome. Yeah. And it's not far from here, I, I guess. It's only a few hours, right? Yeah. Um, So in our remaining couple of minutes, um, can we pray together? Uh, so this, let me tell you where this is from. This is out of um, the St. Benedict prayer book, which if you want to pick up a copy, talk to me, I'll try and figure out how to track it down. It's published by Ampleforth Abbey in England. They're a Benedictine rite or monastery in England. It's got two weeks of brief morning prayer um, that you can go through Monday through Sunday twice and one week of evening prayer. What we're gonna do is their Compline service, and then it has various other prayers. Um, so grab your handout, and in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Almighty Father, before we sleep, give us your blessing and forgiveness, and together let us pray. Lord, accept our sorrow for our sins. Forgive us for our faults of thought and word, for what we have done, and for what we have failed to do. Restore us to the likeness of your Son, and grant us that peace which the world cannot give. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. And here is Psalm 4. When I call, answer me, O God of justice. From anguish you release me. Have mercy and hear me. O men, how long will your hearts be closed? Will you love what is futile and seek what is false? It is the Lord who grants favors to those whom he loves. The Lord hears me whenever I call him. Fear him, do not sin, ponder on your bed, and be still. Make justice your sacrifice, and trust in the Lord. What can bring us happiness, many say? Lift up the light of your face on us, O Lord. You have put into my heart a greater joy than they have from abundance of corn and new wine. I will lie down in peace, and sleep comes at once. For you alone, Lord, make me dwell in safety. And this is a reading from the first letter of Peter. Blessed be God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who in his great mercy has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into a heritage that can never be spoiled or soiled and never fade away. It is reserved in heaven for you who are being kept safe by God's power through faith until the day of salvation, which has been prepared, is revealed at the final point of time. And let's say together this prayer of St. Anselm. O Lord, my God, Teach my heart this day where and how to see you, where and how to find you. You have made me and remade me. You have bestowed upon me all the good things I possess. And still I do not know you. I have not yet done that for which I was made. Teach me to seek you, for I cannot seek you unless you teach me, or find you unless you show yourself to me. 
Let me seek you in my desire. Let me desire you in my seeking. Let me find you by loving you. Let me love you when I find you. And um, we'll say this antiphon before and after the Nunc Dimittis here. So together, save us, Lord, while we are awake. Protect us while we sleep, that we may keep watch with Christ and rest with him in peace. Now, Lord, you have kept your word. Let your servant go in peace. With mine own eyes I have seen thy salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all people, a light to reveal you to the nations and the glory of your people, Israel. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Save us, Lord, while we are awake. Protect us while we sleep, that we may keep watch with Christ and rest with him in peace. Visit, we pray you, Lord, this house and family, and drive far from it all the snares of the enemy. Let your holy angels dwell in this place for our protection and peace, and let your blessing be always upon us through Christ our Lord. Amen. May the Lord grant us peace this night and perfect peace hereafter. gets better and better. And um, next week is our last um, class, and CJ will be teaching. He will do uh, St. Augustine and his mother, uh, Monica. And you may have to sing a little bit of that. Uh, I would like to be able to, to keep CJ in your prayers. He's in, uh, he's okay, but he is in Ohio because his sister became ill and had a stroke and is in the hospital. So he's up there with her. And I, I feel like he's a part of us because he's been here yeah. every, every week and he'll be our concluding speaker. So keep him in your prayers. Yes. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. For Thank you. Um, yes. Can we also keep Tom Benz, who's here with us, and Nancy? They are supposed to be going to remain at Point and Shoot to pray for them and their Ukrainian corpus. He didn't oh, just just give them all. All. Yeah. <laughs> Yes. Sure. Father, we are grateful for your grace and your mercy in our lives. Lord, we ask for the nation of Ukraine, for her people, for her children, for her orphans, that you would hold them in your arms, that you would breathe your life, your peace, your direction, your provision, that you would preserve this people. Father, we pray for the people of Russia, that you would hold them close to you, and that you would bring peace to this portion of our world. Father, we give ourselves to you once again at the foot of the cross. We ask, Lord, that you would show us, continually show us who you are and what you would have us to do with our lives. Please, Lord, stay at work in us until you have accomplished your purpose in each one of us. We give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Sean. I, I couldn't see the little chair over here. Thank you. We are so honored that you two all with us. And I don't know if you know it, but you certainly and your children are very And I'm sure those of everybody in this world. We are grateful. Thank you. Yay, you. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. Ha, 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 ha.